farming will still be a very hot topic for the next weeks and months. Thank you for your explanation. Uh, we make a very short break uh, to welcome Vice President Chinas, and uh, we go to the agenda item number eight. Okay, so we start again uh, with the agenda item number eight. I very much welcome uh, Vice President Margaritis Chinas uh, on the communication on drawing the early lessons from the COVID-19 pandemic. So as we all know, uh, the European Commission uh, released its communication on the 15th, 15th sorry, of June on the uh, lessons learned from the COVID-19 pandemic and the management. We, there is a, a list of key priorities uh, to move forward. And of course, uh, we expect you, Vice President, to, uh, to make the case, I would say, for these uh, uh, proposals. And uh, a lot of them are in the remit of, almost all of them are in the remit of uh, the NV committee. So I think it's very appropriate that we can have an in-depth discussion on this uh, issue. And of course, members will probably provide additional lessons to be learned uh, uh, from their perspective. Um, uh, as the members know, we have now, uh, we have been uh, engaging on a weekly contact group for a couple of months now between the Commission and uh, the Parliament. Uh, and uh, you have, uh, as uh, all the members of the relevant committees, meeting ITRE, uh, INTA, NNV, you have uh, the feedbacks uh, of this uh, weekly contact group, and uh, a lot of you have already participated to that. So uh, it's uh, the opportunity for me to thank uh, Vice President Chinas for the uh, setting of this contact group and the uh, regular organization, and actually ma making sure that all the relevant commissioners and vice presidents take uh, place uh, in this uh, and participate to this uh, regular weekly contact group meeting. So thank you for that. So now we focus on substance, and I'm very happy to have you here for real. <laughs> uh, that's probably the first uh, one uh, we have that, uh, that kind of uh, in-person uh, meeting with the commissioner uh, since uh, actually uh, more than uh, 15 months. So happy to start again this way to work together. The floor is yours for 10 to 15 minutes. Uh, thank you, uh, dear Pascal, uh, dear friends, honorable members. Ça fait du bien d'être en physique. There is no parliament uh, worthy of its name uh, that uh, eludes physical contact, so I'm delighted to have this opportunity to discuss our communication on the uh, lessons learned. Uh, this is arguably the uh, dealing with the pandemic. It has been the centerpiece of our joint work in our lives for this year, and uh, let's see if uh, this will continue to be in the weeks and months ahead. Uh, we do know that the pandemic is not yet just, uh, it's not over yet, but we also know, or we are at least able to assess calmly at this stage what went well and what did not go so well. And that's essentially the, the, the purpose of, of my presentation here and of our report a few days ago. Uh, let me first with a word of context. Um, I would say there are two uh, parameters when we're discussing the context of this exercise. The first, and this is a reality, is that no country and no region in the world was fully prepared for the breadth, the intensity, and the scale of the pandemic. And the European Union and our member states were no exception. The second uh, 
introductory, I would say, uh, contextual remark is that health policy in Europe is still in its nascent era. This means that there was a huge asymmetry between people's expectations of a Europe that would be able to deliver immediately in an area which is key to their lives, but at the same time, the very weak legal basis on health policy in the treaty, which in itself conditioned many of at least our early steps in, in fighting the pandemic. Um, this is the right time now, moving beyond these uh, context remarks, this is the right time to discuss what we can learn, how we might be better prepared next time, and how we can organize and structure our response effectively in the future. And that this is the core of why uh, the Commission uh, adopted this communication on the 15th of, July, of June, which was also at the heart of the discussions of heads of state and government last week in the European Council. If we look back of what happened in the last 15, six months, um, I think one has to have uh, uh, the courage to acknowledge uh, all the colors around the uh, EU way of dealing with the pandemic, and that is precisely we structured uh, uh, a level of organized this dialogue with Parliament around the heart of our response, which was of the vaccines, and this, as Pascal just said, took the form of a contact group in the European Parliament on vaccines, and this group was brought forward lots of constructive dialogue, many suggestions from your side, and in a way it shaped many of the aspects that you find in this communication. Um, the communication sets out our view that we had not taken health preparedness and planning seriously enough before the pandemic. And uh, the early stages of the pandemic had been characterized by responses at national level which were fragmented, which were ad hoc, which were temporary, and which were patchy and uncoordinated. As a result, we lost valuable time in the early stages. Uh, member states tried to move under the pressure of events by doing all the things that didn't help. Uh, export bans, fighting each other for personal protective equipment, uh, building uh, obstacles in trade, uh, all, all the sorts of things that by now we know that didn't help. But things improved later, and the resolution that this House, the European Parliament, adopted uh, in April last year, I think sums it up in a, in a way that I could not uh, improve when you said that member states, having acted unilaterally at the beginning, now understand that cooperation, confidence and solidarity are the only way to overcome the crisis. I think this is the right choice of words, and I think that by now we should be able to give credit where credit is due. Is after this clumsy first week, the European response was ample, it was generous, and it also brought unprecedented initiatives. Um, some would say important federalist moves that were delivered in record time. I will only mention a few of these remarkable uh, achievements. Of course, the common EU vaccine strategy which ensured that we have safe and affordable vaccines for every European, regardless of uh, level of income or uh, geography. We also managed to produce in record time the COVID certificate, which is the return to our normality. We imposed the Green Lanes initiative that maintained the integrity of supply chains and kept our supermarkets stocked during the difficult months. And also, we were instrumental in producing the COVAX initiative and the EU pledging event that raised billions to support the fair distribution of vaccines and treatments across the globe. In our view, 
the added value of working together as Europeans and coordinating our efforts was made pretty clear. And by now, only people of ill faith and bad will would challenge that. I also want to say here in this House that the support of the European Parliament throughout this process was essential. Essential in developing these initiatives and putting them into practice. And I'm very grateful to this House and all the members for playing a key, an instrumental role in our uh, response. It is not the first time that the EU has had to take unprecedented measures during the crisis. If we go back to the financial and economic crisis of 2008-2009, you would see that this was the moment where our banking union was born. And we can now recognize that the work to strengthen our economic resilience as a result of that crisis paid off. Because when it comes to the economic impact of the pandemic, there again, the EU action was decisive. We had tools already in place which remain dormant most of the time, but could be triggered immediately in time of need. And we also had the political will and stamina to address our shortcomings. So overall, having hidden the lessons of the financial crisis, we could act with speed, with ambition and coherence. And the same pattern of reaction, I think it's uh, fully transposable to our work in the health area. And this is what I come to discuss here with you. I, if you look at our communication, we have a decalogue, 10 specific lessons drawn and remedial action to accompany them and better things. But uh, I would like to, for the sake of our discussion today, to cluster this uh, decalogue in three broad areas so that we can facilitate our exchange. The first area is that we have to make absolutely sure in the future that the European Union and our institutions must have the right information to know what's going on. To enable us to put the proper policy response in place, we need to know early on the data and the information necessary to act. So better surveillance and data gathering is key. This is even more relevant today because we know that the pandemic course runs in parallel to the emergence of new variants. And according to ECDC, the Delta variant is at least 40 to 60 percent more transmissible than the Alpha one and associated with a higher risk of hospitalization. The communication that we proposed that we adopted in June uses modeling forecasts to estimate the spread of the variant in Europe over the summer. And this careful monitoring and surveillance is precisely the area I'm referring to. We need to use the available information as foresight. And I'm happy to uh, come in more detail into the Q&A session. This message remain key. Getting both doses of the vaccines available in a toolbox can protect against variants and curb the pandemic. Our vaccine strategy is working, and our efforts now should be to ensure the vaccination rollout proceeds hastily. The second family of issues, the second family of issues learned, the lessons learned, is that we need the right instruments and structures in place at EU level to operate in peacetime under normal circumstances so that we can always, at all times, build a level of preparedness. And here we look forward to the establishment of our European Health Emergency Preparedness and Response Authority, also known as HERA, and we will make new proposals to improve the overall constellation of preparedness. An annual State of Preparedness report will be established covering the EU and our member states. And this will develop as an important project of common European interest to strengthen cutting edge research. Family of issues number three, we also need tools, the right tools to be able to deploy immediately in a crisis situation. Tools to be actively 
and used when needed. We think the EU needs the possibility to activate a pandemic state of emergency, building on what we already proposed in our European Health Union package last November. This new status of an EU pandemic state of emergency would act as the trigger to provide our union with a crisis toolbox when needed. Look, for example, at how we were ready with another area that your committee deals with, the civil protection mechanism. Uh, how we managed there. That meant that we could help, for example, through repatriation more quickly than if we had had to create something from scratch. As well as these points, the communication also puts emphasis on the global dimension. Here, as with many other issues, we look at what needs to happen in the future. In the short term, where we must continue to lead global efforts to ensure access to vaccines, but also in the longer term, where we need to step up initiatives like the Africa Initiative to improve the world's structural preparedness. The international response to the pandemic has been from the very start a priority, a European priority. And this is a priority that we should collectively be very proud for having delivered. We contributed as Europeans to spearheading the global rollout of vaccines thanks to the massive Team Europe support to COVAX of over 3 billion euros, of which 1.3 billion euros from the EU budget. Beyond financial support, Recent summits have allowed to illustrate our ambition with other examples of global solidarity. We have committed through Team Europe to donate at least 100 million doses to low- and middle-income uh, countries by the end of this year, and to help Africa with an additional 1 billion euro for manufacturing and access to vaccines, medicines, health technologies. And we have also joined up efforts at the G7 and decided sharing 1, million, 1 billion doses through COVAX. Overall, in crisis, in this crisis, we managed to prove to the world that Europe is engaged in a solidarity of action, in solidarité de fait, not in a solidarity of declaratory politics. To conclude, Allow me to stress again that many of the points in our lessons learned communication were in a way prefigured, pre-shaped in your uh, particularly well-drafted resolution of April last year. This resolution that came very early in the process identified a number of crucial elements to address already more than a year ago the need to reduce our dependency when it comes to strategically important products, the need for better preparedness, the need to tackle disinformation, a more coordinated pan-European approach to large-scale clinical trials, keeping our internal borders open and keeping global supply chains flowing. All these elements you will also find in our communication. All your suggestions have indeed been incorporated in our thinking. Last week, heads of state and government discussed this communication, and they invited the Slovenian presidency to take forward this work to increase our collective preparedness and response capacity. We are very happy to uh, see that our leaders spend a lot of time discussing these lessons learned communication. I think this is a very positive sign. Now we must start discussing concretely how to translate all this early harvest of lessons into concrete action. And this is a job that we have to do together. And of course we must bear in mind that plants may have to adapt as an involving epidemiological situation will certainly require us to continue reflecting and adjusting. I look now forward to hearing your views and proposals, and for my part, uh, I think by now uh, you should know that I have been uh, uh, a faithful uh, contact point 
uh, for this, uh, not only for this uh, super committee of, of environment, but also for your colleagues in the committee of uh, industry and international trade through our contact group uh, cooperation and beyond. This is the only way to work, working together beyond turfs, beyond boundaries. This is the European way, if I may say. Thank you.